it's a it's a uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today, and I, I really want to thank you for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. And um, Margie and I, Margie Paris and I, uh, the dean of this wonderful law school, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, visit with each other at the uh, recent event that took place across the street at Hayward Field uh, when the Olympics was happening. And we had a chance to visit with each other, get to meet each other. So it was, uh, that was obviously a very exciting time. So uh, I have to say that I'm really uh, honored to join you today as you really explore the limitations of this finite earth uh, that we live on. Uh, I think all of us would recognize that right now we are certainly living uh, in pretty interesting times. <laughs> Although, unlike the Chinese proverb, I'm not sure whether that's a blessing or a curse, but I am quite certain that I wish these times were not quite as interesting as they've been in the last few weeks. Um, making any kind of economic projection uh, these days is pretty, pretty, well, it's pretty dumb. Um, I guess that's the right way to say it. Uh, we've entered some very perilous economic times, and making any kind of estimate on our future business climate may be really a bit uncertain uh, at best. But here in Oregon, uh, there are a few things we really can uh, be sure of. And one of them is that something quite incredible is going on here, and most of it has been happening really under the radar. Uh, other states and other countries talk a lot about developing a green economy and finding ways to take advantage of these changing economic and scientific circumstances that we are, in fact, in. But in Oregon, we've got some very real accomplishments and a real reason to believe that we're ready for the new environmental and economic realities that the future is preparing for us. Our efforts here really aren't new. They aren't just all of a sudden. Uh, now, we get a young audience here, but I'm sure at least some of you um, remember all those hippies who moved here from California in the 1970s. <laughs> Everyone thought that those hippies were commies or socialists or something. And it turns out that they were, in fact, capitalists. Who knew? Well, maybe even they didn't know it at that time. But uh, in those days, they called it alternative lifestyles. They developed organic farming, alternative energy, and re rejected the existing business ethics and practices of the day. Today, four decades later, we're left with the legacy of alternative energy and organic farming practices that at last, here in the 21st century, meshes with the nation's economic climate. Now, we're asking a lot. We need industries that will energize our job base, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, keep our air clean, help stop global warming, and make a lot of money. And we want that to happen all at the same time. The green economy clearly is, in fact, here. It's no longer theory, some far-off dream for the future, but something that is playing out right in front of us today uh, with clean energy, manufacturing plants, jobs, and a promise of a whole lot more. Now, 
If we've learned anything in the last few weeks, it's that we must be very wary of financial projections. This is a very volatile time, and clearly anything can happen. But where we're coming from might help us understand where we are, in fact, going as a state. For most of our modern history, Oregon's rural and urban areas shared a very natural connection. The rural areas did what rural areas have always done. They grew crops, they cut down trees, and they fished the ocean. And the urban areas did what urban areas uh, traditionally do. They milled the logs, they processed the crops, and they ate the fish. The urban and rural areas knew each other, and they depended on each other. You could find Democrats in the rural areas. I was one of them. I represented the most, one of the most rural areas in Oregon on the southwestern Oregon coast. I was elected as a Democrat. And uh, basically, you had uh, Republicans in the city as well. So Democrats in the country, Republicans in the city, quite a mix. Today, the resource industries, fish and timber in particular, are a shadow of their former dominance in rural Oregon, while high tech dominates the jobs picture in the Portland area. That mutual dependence that bound us together in the past is gone, and so has a lot of the urban-rural communication. Aggravating that, aggravating that disconnect is how our urban areas have become largely democratic and the rural areas have become largely uh, Republican. Not entirely, but largely. But Oregon is lucky that we have an abundance of the greatest natural resource of all. That's the sun, the wind, and the ocean. And that's where we can find our economic and energy future that will bring the urban and rural areas of this state together in a strong bond. Let's talk first about the sun. The sun, I think all of you know probably better than I, the sun is really the greatest and most abundant of our natural resources, but we're only now beginning to tap its incredible potential. And it's, it's here, it's out the window. It's not under the control of tyrants or dictators. You don't have to mine it. You don't have to drill it. It gets here all on its own. Most of the time, anyway, especially here in Oregon. Uh, we think of Oregon as, sometimes we think of Oregon as it gets a little later in the year. We think of Oregon as rainy and gloomy. Uh, and there's a lot of truth in that image. Well. Maybe not gloomy, but certainly at least rainy. But eastern and southern Oregon receive roughly the same solar energy as northern Florida. Already, we're seeing major industries being attracted to Oregon. Solar World, the German company and one of the it's a German company and it's one of the largest solar energy companies in the world and it's opening its plant in Hillsboro, first US, first plant they've located in the United States, located in Hillsboro, later this month. By the end of the year, it will have several hundred employees manufacturing photovoltaic cells. Soleil, which opened a new facility in Portland last year, at full capacity, the plant will employ more than 180 skilled workers and turn out silicon ingots and wafers that have the potential, potential to produce 180 megawatts in the first year. SpectraWatt, which is an Intel startup, will be making photovoltaic cells in Hillsboro. Sanyo, planning an $80 million solar cell production plant in Salem with 200 new jobs. And we have Peak Sun Silicone, 
which broke ground this year on a polysilicone manufacturing plant in Millersburg, which is just north of Albany. The company is based here in Oregon. It's based in Salem and has plans to raise $718 million and create 500 jobs by the end of 2011. They're working on a low energy system to produce high quality polysilicone for solar cells. If their pilot project, it's now underway, is successful, it could be a major economic game changer, both for the solar industry, but also a major game changer for us here in Oregon. Now, this all wasn't an accident. Our loan programs at the state level gave them loans, and Oregon tax credit programs gave them tax credits. Clearly, as the demand for solar energy increases around the country and around the world, more and more people will be doing business with the Oregon solar industry. Now, it's obviously hard to project such things, uh, but especially, uh, and it's hard to project them especially today, uh, but sometime in the next seven or eight years, all these new solar businesses could mean $3 billion in sales. And that's about where the timber industry is today, about $3 billion in sales. And maybe uh, it will mean as many as four or 5,000 new jobs in the state of Oregon. We really may become known as the solar forest although we may have to come up with a better nickname than Solar Forest, but it's, it's certainly a possibility for us. Another incredible resource uh, here in Oregon um, is as the sun shines, so does the wind blow. Uh, we can't really say that wind energy is older than electricity itself, even though it predates Benjamin Franklin and his kite. Wind energy does predate that. Wind energy has only recently started to flourish as an economic powerhouse, and it too is poised to bring major benefits, especially to rural Oregon. Yes, these benefits include clean energy, and yes, it will mean new jobs. But more than that, we've also found out that wind farms mean additional revenue for the farmers and other property owners whose lands are the homes to these giant turbines. And they mean new property tax revenues for local governments that are already choking on reductions in revenue from other sources, like reductions in the ONC funds that many of the rural counties receive. They mean new spending. The wind farms mean new spending in rural communities. And obviously, there's a multiplier effect uh, because of these new payrolls. And they mean new libraries and help for schools under the, what's called the Strategic Investment Program. This was a special tax break designed to spur the high-tech industry in the mid-1990s. And it's unlike a lot of other tax breaks, this tax break actually worked very well. And it really should be called the Intel Retention Program is really what you should call it. It was passed by the legislature to try to keep Intel here. And it really did help keep Intel functioning here in Oregon. But Intel is in the suburbs, and now that tax break is being used in a big way by these wind farms with big capital startup costs, and that's brought benefits to local governments and rural communities. Now, we're not talking about little windmills helping to run the family farm. We're talking about big, multi-megawatt wind farms with, you, I, you all know them, with the giant propellers that spin in the wind. Oregon now has 10 such farms with another seven farms under construction. Eight other farms have been approved and seven more are in the review stage. That means that we may have no fewer than 32 
wind farms in this state. Now, these certainly are not the kinds of operations that you can squeeze into a block in the Pearl District. Uh, we find them, where do we find them? We find them in our wide open spaces, places like the Columbia Plateau. But now some are headed to Union and Harney County, which are in eastern and southeastern Oregon as well. So the benefits are spreading. Already these wind farms are screaming for technicians, and Columbia Gorge Community College in the Dalles has more students than it can handle for its renewable energy technology degrees. And what's really so exciting is those students in renewable energy are finding jobs even before they graduate. Now, sun, wind, waves. We know less about the potential for wave energy, but we do know that the Oregon coast is one of the most promise, promising sites in North America for wave energy generation. We do know that Oregon State University is a world leader in studying wave energy. They've got some terrific work going on there, and we do know that we're going to learn more about wave energy and its potentials in the years ahead. Last month, the U.S. Department of Energy awarded a $6.25 million grant to OSU for an ocean energy research center in Newport. It's going to be called the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center and will help bridge the gap between university research and commercial development of wave energy. Now, we could see a tremendously exciting new energy source develop right here on our shores with all the spin-offs and re related development that that could bring. Now, this won't be without some controversy. Some fishermen worry that these wave energy buoys might harm their fishing grounds. Uh, but we have a track record of solving these kinds of conflicts. conflicts. We had a similar problem when it came to, uh, came to the time uh, when uh, fiber optic was uh, being run across the Pacific Ocean and wanted, they wanted to land in Oregon. Some Oregon fishermen very understandably and correctly worried about the impact uh, that these fiber optic cables would have on their ability to work the fishing grounds. But we created a special fiber optic undersea cable commission and we addressed their concerns and now we have not one but three trans-Pacific fiber optic cables that arrive in North America here in Oregon. And the fiber optic cable companies all say that the best thing we ever did was create the Undersea Cable Commission because it really resolves the conflicts before they're created. So we can work the same process with the wave energy. If there are concerns over the fishing grounds, we can really bring everyone together and make the situation work. We'll make sure that this new exciting industry won't devastate an existing industry. So we've accomplished a lot. The legislat legislature has made us a leader in offering tax breaks and other incentives to lure these new industries to Oregon and their work is starting to pay off. But we really can't let up now. We've had weeks of bad news out there in the world, but let's finish this really on an upbeat note. A report just this week that was produced by Clean Edge and Climate Solutions said that solar power could bring more than 22,000 jobs to Oregon and Washington in the next two decades, 6,000 new jobs in wind power, 17,000 jobs in green building designs, 10,000 jobs in bioenergy, and 7,000 new jobs in smart energy grid technologies. 
And I confess I don't really fully understand what smart energy grid technologies are. Maybe you do, but I'm very excited about them. <laughs> so Oregon can help lead the nation in, ad in addressing problems related very directly to global warming. These challenges also offer us a rare opportunity to lead the nation in developing new energy sources, stimulating our green economy and invigorating the 21st century job base in both rural and urban Oregon. We've already been real leaders. This is a chance we just can't let slip away. We've got to make sure that we grab it and benefit from it because it's right in front of us. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen, uh, like, in, um, on the East Coast, um, what is it? It's, there's a, uh, on the East Coast, there's some wind farms proposed offshore. Uh, so if you did that, you'd have to obviously run the lines back onto the shore, and that's one of the issues with, wind, with uh, wave buoys, is that you obviously have to have a way to move the power that's being generated on the shore. So there might be a great way to combine them. I just don't know whether the, the, the wave energy sites and the offshore wind sites would, in fact, be close enough to each other so that you could do that. But it's certainly something that ought to be looked at. It's a good question. Yes? How, how do you see uh, the Oregon educational enterprise uh, preparing um, uh, our, our young students You've asked an absolutely critical question regarding how does the inter education system in Oregon I I interface with this new economic opportunity. It's real clear to me that there, obviously it's important that you train all your students well in K through 12, but as it relates to new energy industries, there are two parts of the education spectrum that are absolutely critical. The first is community colleges to do job training for wind turbine te technicians and their renewable energy centers and, and the like. The second is higher ed. And I believe very strongly that this state has really dropped the ball on higher ed. I'm really, uh, my father was a professor at the University of Chicago, so I have a bias toward higher education. But I really believe that higher education is going to play an absolutely critical role in the research and understanding that we're going to need to really fully utilize these, these resources. So it strikes me that the educational enterprise needs to be from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. And we can't sort of let one part of that fall by the wayside. And I think it's critical uh, for jobs that we really support our community colleges and higher ed to develop these industries. Bill, thanks for coming. And I have a question. Oregon rightfully can be proud of the business energy tax credits we have here. It's up to 50% tax credit over five years. Solar development wind farms are eligible there. But it's still a tax credit. For instance, for the University of Oregon to install a photovoltaic system here, they need a target. Right. Do you see any traction, any possibility of similar uh, legislation in Oregon? Well, I, 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 I love your example that you're using about Germany because it's, it's, it's incredible 
what Germany has done with solar power. I mean, it's, it, it really developed the industry, and that's exactly how they've developed it, is by basically providing everybody, whether you be a private business or a, a nonprofit or a homeowner or a big apartment building owner, with, uh, with funding to basically pay the costs, the, you know, the, the additional costs of, of solar. Um, and the, the challenge, I mean, I'd love that in Oregon too, but I got to tell you, the challenge is how do we pay for that and everything else? So I, I'm supportive of it, but we're headed toward, as Phil Barnhart, our good state representative from this area, will tell you, we're headed for tough times in Oregon. The budget is not going to be pretty in 2009. Uh, and so it's like, uh, not probably not too much percentage in proposing major new spending programs right now. Yes? I'm wondering if renewable methane as alternative energy comes up in the conversations or plans at all. Oh, it comes up. I mean, you know, the whole potential with uh, methane, uh, the potential with uh, particularly ethanol not made from corn shipped from Iowa, but ethanol produced from forest wastes uh, and the like in Oregon. All, all those things come up uh, and, and there are some major efforts being made to, to really make use of those resources. I steer your attention to a place uh, east or west, no, east of Corvallis, Stallbush Island Farms. They're building, uh, they do a lot of sustainable agricultural production, both uh, organic and uh, Food Alliance certified, uh, you know, food. And uh, they're building right now a methane uh, digester that will be producing lots of energy from uh, the food waste that they're producing at, at Salvage Island Farms. So there are lots of potentials for that as well. And they, can, they certainly can be used by people in this state. Yes? Um, kind of touching back on education, I'm a very big supporter of edu higher education and the track record of, of looking at students early on and following them all the way through with the right skill set. How do we ensure that our current underemployed communities and undertrained communities and the, the dislocated industri industry workers who are uh, don't get left behind in this green economy. What kind of, how can we make sure they get trained to come along? Well, I think the key, is that, and, and that's really partly why I mentioned community colleges, because community colleges really are, there's a community college in Coos Bay, there's a community college in the Dallas, there's a community college in Pendleton, there's community colleges all over both the urban and rural parts of the state. They reach those rural communities, and that's why it's so important that community colleges be part of uh, the, the job training that, that, can, that <coughs> needs to be done for these new, uh, these new technologies. You've got a lot of people who have a lot of skills. You had to be pretty smart to be a, uh, work in a sawmill and pick which, which cuts were cut for which and what. Uh, and uh, you know, those, there's a whole bunch of those people that are right, right now kind of not being utilized as best they could. They need some new, they need some retraining. And that's the role that community colleges really can play. Uh, and, and I think higher ed plays a role that's much more focused on the research and development side of it in terms of how do we make use of these in an effective and, and a cost-effective way. So can you okay. all um, join me in thanking? Thank you.